In the summer of 1995, in the month of August, probably a few days before my birthday, um, I became born again. I uh, remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, the name of the church, Allen AME on Merrick Boulevard. Um, at this time, the church was at the school because they had a private school and they would, uh, on Sundays, they would have church in a gymnasium. So I remember, you know, I, I was playing for a basketball for this coach um, named Chun. And what he would do was come pick me up from my mom's house. We lived in Rosedale at the time. Anyone from uh, the Springfield area knows where Rosedale is, not too far from Green, A Green Acres Mall. And he would pick me up from Rosedale. We would go to the first service. It was six in the morning because I was to help out, you know, in the kitchen, you know, because, uh, you know, he would cook, you know. If you go to the black church, you know that you get some pretty good food on sale on S Sunday service. And so me and a couple of the guys from the basketball team, you know, we're sitting in listening to the service and Reverend Floyd Flake, he's talking about sin. Um, and it really hit me. It really hit me because I knew the life that I was living privately. And so I'll never forget it. I was walking down the aisle and it felt like the longest walk of my life to go to the front um, to the podium. Black church, we call it the altar. And stand there before everyone and profess that I knew that I was a sinner and that I had private sins going on in my life and I wanted Jesus to fix it. And so I became born again at that time. I confessed that I was a sinner. I knew that I had sins and I knew that if I didn't deal with this issue that I would go to hell. But boy, that walk down the aisle, it felt like I was walking it alone, though there were other people coming up there as well. It felt like I was walking it alone. And in the summer of 1995, in the month of August, not too many days from my birthday, I became born again. One of the struggles that I had as being this new born again believer was how do I stop doing the things that I was doing? Because it's easy to say you walk by faith and not by sight or salvation is by faith. But what does that mean when you've professed 
that you're a sinner before God and you want to have Jesus in your life and the whole object of him shedding his blood for your sins is so that they can be taken away. So does that mean that I continue on? Because I can tell you that privately, after becoming born again, I kept doing what I was doing. You know, the sins that I was committing just didn't go away because I went down to the altar and I confessed Jesus as the Lord of my life. You know, but I didn't understand how the fruit would happen. You know, how would I stop sinning? Because that's the reason why I walked down that long aisle to go to the altar to give my life to God was so that, number one, I believe that he died for my sins, but I also believe that if I continue in my sins, that I'll go to hell. A minister suggested one time that I start by reading the book of John, you know, the gospel of John. And I can tell you, though I read it, and I've read the entire Bible one time in my life, it didn't help. Because I wasn't being taught. You know, it's one thing to preach about the fact that Jesus died for my sins. But it's another thing to be taught how to live a holy life. And that just wasn't happening. And so, yeah, I continued on doing the things that I was doing and it didn't feel good. And it felt disgusting, quite actually. Um, so what did I do? I have to start from the beginning. When I was maybe seven or eight, um, you know, me and my brother, when we would do silly things, you know, and whatnot, snooping around. And one day we were playing around and crawling up to my dad's room. And privately, my dad was watching pornography. Now, I didn't know what truly was happening, but all I know is that what I saw, and that was the beginning of the seed that was planted in my mind. By the time that I was 12 years old, that's when the addiction started. I was addicted to pornography. That was the struggle that I was seeking God's help.
And I'm not saying that God didn't help me because the end of this story will be quite different from a lot of people's story. From my junior high school years all the way up to my early 40s, I struggled with pornography. I, it was something that I fought. I tried to do everything to quit. I tried to do everything in my power to let this sin go. I was unsuccessful doing it by myself. Dealing with pornography, it had definitely put a strain on my marriage because obviously, you know, you don't want your wife feeling like she's not the only, she's not the only one who can please you. She definitely felt blindsided catching me in the act. So my wife became fully aware that I struggled with pornography in my early I want to say 30s. Um, she wasn't judgmental, but she was definitely instrumental in me getting help. Now, when I say me getting help, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, going to a counselor and, you know, talking things out and what have you, but I'll be real with you. You know, going to therapy, it didn't help. Pornography is not something that you can talk out of your system. Um... It's the worst battle in the world. The worst battle in the world. And especially when you are a Christian. When you are a follower of Christ and you know that you are supposed to be doing the right things, but... Mentally, you have this fight. You want to do what's right, but the desire overtakes you. It's a battle in such a tough battle that you feel like it's impossible to overcome. You feel like, you know, you feel like trash, quite frankly, when you're going through the motions and you know, you go a few weeks, you feel like you made it, and then 
it happens. That desire creeps back up because you've seen this one clip on TV or you've seen this one female maybe on TikTok or you've seen this image of a female on Instagram. You who are struggling with pornography, you know what I mean. You know what I'm talking about. I don't have to explain to you. I wanted to know the truth. I understood that I could not continue living this private life. Struggling with pornography as a follower of Christ. And pretending like everything is well in my life. It was a lie. I was pretending. And a lot of us Christians, in one way or another, are dealing with something privately that they are pretending Sunday after Sunday, going to church, listening to the pastor, pretending, getting nowhere. It was all pretense. And my private life was struggling. And there's no amount of prosperity gospel that was gonna fix that. So I had to know the truth. I went on my journey. I went on my journey to learn something that I did not know. Something that was right there in front of my face reading through the scriptures time and time again, things like, truly, truly, I say unto you, and the one who commits sin is the slave of sin. Or things like in the book of Hebrews, if you willfully sin after knowing the truth there's no more sacrifice for sins you know the hebrew israelites they say you have to keep the commandments which i don't disagree with because if you read first john it says that. And then in the book of 1 John, it also says that sin is a transgression of the law. But then if you listen to the Christian, you hear that you're not under the law anymore, which is absolutely correct. Both parties are correct. But then Paul, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul and the book of Romans change me forever. And the Apostle Paul nailed my struggle to the T. When he said, 
for that which I want to do, I don't do. And I'm paraphrasing there. But the point he was making is that in his mind, he wants to do what the law says, but he can't because his flesh. And that's exactly what's happening when you're dealing with pornography. So I understood completely what the Apostle Paul said. And then Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciple indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And I realized I realized then that I didn't know the truth because if I knew the truth and I'm not talking about the fact that Jesus died for our sins. Yes, that is obviously the truth, but that's part, that's the basic part of the gospel. That's the part that's supposed to drive you to think about your sins and commit your life to God. But what happens after that? What happens after you've given your life to God, but yet you find yourself in the situation where you're still doing the same things that you did after you gave your life to God. That's where the pretense is in full effect. But when Jesus said, that you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. I knew that I didn't have the truth. Once God grants you to have eyes to see, then you'll begin to see the truth and see him as he is. And so my uh, studies in Hebrew and Greek, you know, really began in 2012. And I've been learning ever since. I can't fluently speak because you have to have conversation between yourself and someone else who, who speaks Hebrew, but you can read it if you understand the, the you know, the grammatical functions of the language. And so it wasn't until then did I realize some of the things that Moses talked about as it relates to Genesis chapter three and, you know, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and that understanding that became important in the freedom that I now live 
from pornography. That truth and what I read in the book of Romans, what I listened to in the book of Romans from chapter one all the way to 16, uh, it was so profound. I'd never seen Paul in that way. And then Hebrews, the book of Hebrews sealed it all. As it relates to me uh, ceasing from sin, the book of Hebrews put the icing in on the cake. So today, I'm free from pornography. A battle that I could not have won by myself. The things that I have learned so far and the things that I am discovering in my study are absolutely life-changing. I don't have the desire anymore The only thing that I desire is living this pure life before God without sin, which is the point of the Apostle Paul saying that God wants a church without spot or wrinkle. How are we going to present that to God if we still commit sins like the rest of the world. How are we any different? We're just pretending. We're pretending. I'm definitely going to share the things that I've learned One of the things that you need to understand as it relates to why Jesus spoke parables to these large crowds, but yet he went back and explained it, explained the parables to his disciples. And if you look at, I believe it's Matthew 13, the writer quotes Isaiah chapter six, verse nine and 10. And to paraphrase, because I don't have a Bible in front of me, to paraphrase, uh, it was talking about the fact that these people have eyes and they can't see ears and they can't hear and in mind they can't comprehend he was talking about the fact that the point of Jesus teaching the crowds using parables was not so that they understood the parables but he was keeping those who were on the outside of his discipleship, who were not a part of his disciples, who was not in his everyday circle. Those people, they got the parables because he wanted to keep them blind. And then he told them, he that has an ear, let him hear. He left it up to them to try to figure out what he said. But privately, 
he explained his parables to his disciples. And that's the problem with the church today. The mysteries of the kingdom of God are only granted for those who are in the body of Yahushua Hamashiach. As the world knows him, Jesus Christ. And in those mysteries is the power of life. The power over sin and the power over death. In those mysteries, in those secrets, is how one is going to have eternal life. You don't have to believe me. I'm telling you, though. Because I care, because there's someone out there who is just like me when I was pretending, loves God, wants to do what's right before God's sight, but struggles to get out of that situation because the works of the flesh has a hold on you. I know how you feel because I was there. I was there. I was pretending that everything was okay. I was pretending to follow God, knowing that I was still walking in darkness. Because if you are continuing to sin, you're walking in darkness. You're walking in darkness. God wouldn't even allow Moses to have shoes on in his presence. And you think that God's going to allow you in his presence being filthy with private sins. You're just a pretender. I was just pretending. I didn't know any better because I didn't know the truth. Though I desired to be better, I couldn't because I wasn't really seeking the truth. But when I had enough, when I cried, my eyes out for change. Then and only then did God hear me. And so I know that someone out there truly loves God and truly wants to be changed. And you can. And it starts with knowing the truth. You can believe me. You can disbelieve me. I don't really care. But I've tasted for myself that good word of God. And now I know that I don't have to live a life of sins. There's going to be some person who comes and comments down below saying that I'm so legalistic or Jesus paid it all. Yes, he did for the one who willfully cease from sin by learning the truth, getting the truth and believing the truth. It's that simple. Believing the truth.
but for the one who wants to come out of their personal sins, the ones that you hold privately from even your closest relatives. There's things that I'm going to tell you on this channel. That's going to astound you.